is Dr. Campbell Price, curator of Egypt and Sudan, hopefully broadcasting on our YouTube channel, Manchester Museum's YouTube channel. Um, I am broadcasting exclusively live from Manchester Museum itself. So we're not going to call this hashtag Egyptology from home or Egyptology in lockdown because I'm not at home and we're kind of coming out of lockdown. So it's going to be called Egyptology Live. Very exciting. Um, so I've been in the museum once before, um, a couple of weeks ago, and that was very exciting. But that was the first time all year. Uh, and now I'm back in my office. Um, I've run around quite a lot. So I feel like whew, a bit tired, but it's absolutely delightful to be back in the space, to be next to the collections, to meet colleagues. Uh, to be able to answer inquiries from the archive, because surrounding me, uh, you can see there are lots of filing cabinets. That's Professor Fluffy up there on the top. Um, lots of cabinets, lots of boxes, lots of books, uh, lots of registers. Over here are the registers where, if you ask about what stuff we have, that's where it is. Um, it's been a lot. It's been exciting to come back in to see the shop open, because here in England, and at least we cannot open the museum itself, but we can open the shop uh, so people can come in and buy things, which include da, 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 Gold Mummies of Egypt. I may have mentioned it before um, on these broadcasts, but I'm delighted to say this is now available to buy from our online shop. So you don't even need to be in the museum to actually buy it, which is a great advance. So I'm very excited about that. Um, if you don't own a, a copy, it's a sumptuously executed, uh, beautifully researched, if I do, do say so myself, uh, account of why we are obsessed with gold and mummies in Egypt. And it accompanies our very successful touring exhibition, Golden Mummies of Egypt, which is currently at North Carolina Museum of Art uh, in, in Raleigh. Uh, in the States, and I'm delighted to say that every weekend they've been selling out. So hello to all of our friends in North Carolina. Uh, I was very much hoping to get out there, but that's not happened, that's fine. Um, so exciting time, we're planning for lots of things when we reopen uh, to the public, probably in the middle of next month, and then really putting the finishing touches on a major capital uh, project, major change uh, to the museum. And just today I've put on my hard hat and my proper boots and high-vis jacket and gone to see what's happening in a new spe special exhibition hall. So Manchester Museum is where it's at. Very exciting. Today I've come essentially dressed as a cartoon character uh, of a curator, a uh, new bow tie, uh, new waistcoat, um, to answer your questions. Uh, hopefully... I can't absolutely commit to it, but hopefully I will we'll continue to do these uh, broadcasts live from the museum. Today it's not possible to get into the storerooms, and many people have been asking me, how do we get into the storerooms, Campbell? Um, there are issues there because the internet signal is not strong, so the ability to do a live broadcast like this would be rather compromised. So, as regular viewers will know, uh, I answer your questions, you send them in, I make my best stab at giving you some information about ancient Egypt. In the past, we've done this on uh, the Twitter streaming platform called Periscope. Today, we're doing it on YouTube. Now, I'm yet to work out what happens if you ask me a question live. Please go ahead. Questions, comments are always welcome. Uh, keep them uh, clean. But uh, I have already been asked this week uh, a series of questions which will fill, no doubt, our time. But if you've got a burning question, comment, please do send it to me and I'll try and uh, look out for it while I'm speaking. So thank you again to everyone who engages uh, with this uh, broadcast. It's a, it's a funny old one. Curatorial knowledge about Egyptian stuff. Uh, you can get it in blog form, you can get it in tweet form. I tweet and do Instagram at EgyptMCR, uh, but I'm just as happy to answer the questions live in this format. So, huh, John. Hi, John, if you're watching. John asks three questions. Uh, the first one I really like. Campbell, what is your second favourite object in the collection? Second favourite object in the collection? Well, 
my first favourite object changes all the time, John, as I keep saying. Uh, so it stands to reason that my second favourite object uh, would change all the time too. I have to turn, John, to, uh, to well, to, to an object that's in our Gold Mummies of Egypt show. So it's not currently in Manchester, it's on tour in the United States. Um, just because I, I've been thinking about this recently and have used it in, in lectures, this, you see that, is an image of the god Osiris with the goddess Isis, but can you see Osiris is much smaller than his wife, Isis? And it is a nice illustration of the fact that Isis is a very powerful magician, and it is she who revives the dead Osiris back to life in order to conceive uh, a son. She is the great of magic, she is the great healer, uh, she's the wily sorceress. And so this is kind of realised in this image probably from the site of Tuna el Gebel in the Greco-Roman period, um, open work kind of coffin frame, uh, still beautifully coloured. We didn't know this. We didn't know the site from which this piece came because it had come from a private collection and it wasn't clear uh, its exact archaeological provenance. But then, as often happens, people come in as researchers for a look around and someone, uh, a colleague, uh, Melanie, uh, from the... the, the University of Trier, I think, in Germany, came and said, I've been working at the site of Chunel Gebel, and that looks exactly like the stuff we have. So that is one of the great things of working in a museum, is meeting lots of fascinating people who have lots of knowledge about the collection and trying to soak it up like a sponge. So that is this week's second favourite object, uh, say. You can see it in North Carolina uh, until July. And then the tour will go somewhere else. I can't reveal quite where yet. Uh, not in the United States. And then it will reopen here in our special exhibition hall, uh, which I've just seen uh, the very exciting shell of, towards the end of next year. In time for the Tutankhamun centenary, which anyone with a marginal interest in Egyptology will know, is the 4th of November 2022, 100 years since the tomb of Tutankhamun was discovered. So... If you're watching from the UK, you'll be able to see this and over 100 other objects as part of our inaugural special exhibition programme uh, in our new temporary special exhibition hall. Uh, the hall itself isn't temporary. It will show temporary shows. That's what I mean. Um, you will be able to see that from the end of next year. The mummies will return. That'll be our, our tagline. Look out for some great publicity. So... John asks a couple of other questions, one of them very specific. He asks, uh, Campbell, what do you think of Pharaoh Seneb Ka'i? Now, this is pretty obscure. As recent discoveries go, the mummy, or the remains, I should say, of Pharaoh Seneb Ka'i are quite exciting. Uh, this was an unknown unsuspected royal tomb. The existence of this king wasn't really known for sure. Um, his name may have appeared on a, a kind of boomerang, a ritual boomerang, often known as a birth tusk or a magic wand. Not a Harry Potter kind of magic wand, but um, often they're made of ivory, but this example uh, was made of wood. It was discovered at the site of Abydos, the sacred city of uh, the god Osiris in the south of Egypt, and it was uncovered in the in the course of excavations by the Egypt Exploration Society. And I recently chose it uh, as one of my top 50 objects from ancient Egypt uh, found during the course of EES excavations. If you're not a member, you should join the Egypt Exploration Society and find out lots more. Um, but it intrigues me because this was one mention, and not even a certain mention, of a king's name who otherwise wasn't known. So you've got Ramses the Great, who has his name on bloody everything, but then there are some kings, often kings who didn't rule for very long or who were only active in certain regions of Egypt, who are very much less well attested. So Seneb Ka'i is one of those uh, guys, and his tomb turned up in 2014, I think, an American-Egyptian mission found the tomb and have recently published it. 
Um, there's a big book about it by colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, I think. Um, look out for it, the, the tomb of Pharaoh Senad Kai. So there are things, completely undiscovered pharaohs, to be found. Not the most impressive tomb, it has to be said. Um, not terribly well decorated, and most of the stuff uh, in it had been, been reused and was quite modest. Uh, but, you know, dating from an interesting period in Egyptian history, the second intermediate period, maybe a little local dynasty. Um, and by that I mean the kings only ruled the region of Abydos, that part of the south of Egypt, around what Egyptologists call Dynasty 15 and Dynasty 16. So at the end of the Middle Kingdom, there is the second intermediate period before the so-called Golden Age, the New Kingdom, kicks off um, with, with um, Theban uh, kings. So that's who Phareb Senib Kai is. Great guy. Great guy. Love him. I think he's really interesting. I think the, the find is interesting because it is probably, the I guess, the first royal burial that has been given a complete published account. And that, as I say, has appeared recently. Other burials, like Tutankhamun, yeah, they're well known, but the actual material, the objects in the tombs, haven't been nearly uh, properly uh, studied. So that's a challenge for future. And probably the Tutankhamun centenary will... will inspire a lot more discussion of this. So th thanks for that question. John, your last question is quite random, but I quite like it. What is my favourite title of a god or epithet of a god? So you have standard titles like Horus, uh, Neb Pet, Lord of the Sky. So that's a title of a god. Um, but you have lots of other random ones. So... Two favourites, I'd have to say, uh, John. There is the god Men, Ithephalic, uh, god associated with uh, fertility, who has an epithet, Men, who flaunts his potency. That's a slightly tame uh, 19th century version of uh, translation of that uh, title. And then a favourite, <laughs> favourite one, um, <laughs> just because I like how it trips off the tongue, you get texts that list lots of body parts. They're sometimes referred to as medical, magical texts. And so the idea is you list everyone's body parts and you assign certain gods to the body parts. So you've got a god of the eyebrows or a goddess of the buttocks. You have a lady called, otherwise, I've never heard of her, called Nebet, Nebet Debuet. Nebet Debuet. And she's the lady of the feet. Just love that, Lady of the Feet. So Nebit Debwet gets uh, my vote for my current favourite title uh, of a divinity. So thanks for those questions, John. Shirley, regular viewer Shirley. Hi, Shirley. Um, Shirley asks kind of a controversial question. So Campbell, you have mentioned in these broadcasts uh, before that you're not convinced that the mummy labelled currently as uh, that of Hatshepsut is, in fact, uh, Queen Hatshepsut, the female pharaoh. Are there other royal mummies whose identities should be questioned? As so often, surely, in Egyptology, it depends who you read and what you read. Some people will tell you that we know exactly who everyone is and all the mummies in the royal kingdom are absolutely certain. Other people, myself included, would add a note of caution. DNA studies are not hard and fast answers. DNA science is not a magic wand, as I've said here before, that simply tells you what happens and what happened in the past and who people are and what their favourite you know, colour was. That is not possible, at least at the moment. The process of mummification itself, of course, is a ritual, but it does wreak chemical changes, of course, on human remains that make the preservation of DNA and other testable material problematic. Uh, we found that, that recently with mummies tested at Manchester, Manchester University, that simply nothing survives that's testable or nothing survives that is, is usable for the kind of radiocarbon DNA tests that we might like to conduct. So all of that having been said, 
a lot of the royal mummies were labelled. They were actually captioned, labelled, uh, with hieroglyphic or hieratic texts that give us the name of the person, uh, the people doing the rewrapping at least, thought that person was. So there's an added historical bit of information. Someone like Seneb Ka'i is found in a tomb with his name on it. Chances are it is Seneb Ka'i. Mummy of Tutankhamun. Pretty sure that that's the mummy of Tutankhamun because he was found absolutely, uh, apparently in context. But these mummies that have been, uh, as some have suggested, refugees for eternity, moving around from different tombs, you know, they're not left alone. They are, in some sense, and we'll come back to this, paraded about by the powers that be at different periods in history, in ancient history. And the, the, there are echoes of that today. So I have a general doubt, but there are questions about, uh, for example, that were raised some years ago by an American Egyptologist, Edward Wente, talking about sequences of kings like Amenhotep II, Tutmos IV, Amenhotep III. Maybe there was some mix-ups uh, which create a conundra uh, which come up from the human remains and appear in radiographs and CT scans. DNA, I don't think, has absolutely solved anything. I am, uh, I am sceptical about Hatshepsut. Uh, the, the classic example, of course, is the mummy of uh, whoever it is in tomb KV-55, some relative of Akhenaten, maybe Akhenaten himself, and some relative of Tutankhamun. Is it Smenek Kare? We're not sure. So um, in answer to your questions, are there royal mummies? whose identities should be questioned, surely, yes, is my uh, definitive answer. Now, that leads on rather nicely to a question by Steve. Now, hi, Steve. Steve is a, is a regular uh, listener, regular watcher. Um, Steve, this is something I've, I've planned to do a, a, a blog post about, but I had some computing issues over Easter, which prevented me. Um, hopefully, I'll get back to it. Steve asks, what did you think of uh, the golden parade of pharaohs, the pharaohs uh, golden parade that happened uh, a couple of weeks ago in Cairo from the old museum at downtown Tahrir Square, the Egyptian museum in Cairo, the well-known one, the mummies, 22 royal mummies, mainly from the Deir el-Bakri uh, royal cache and one of the other uh, Valley of the Kings caches, were moved uh, to a new museum at the site of Fustat, a uh, very important site in medieval uh, Cairo, and it's the site of the new National Museum of Egyptian Civilization. Now, I've seen the shell of, of that new museum, and it was looking pretty impressive seven years ago. Uh, now it looks even better, and a lot of Egyptologists were fascinated uh, to see this, but the actual parade itself has generated a lot of discussion. Uh, I watched it uh, online, I streamed it uh, live, and... To be absolutely honest, I found it quite moving. Uh, <laughs> and it wasn't just because I was feeling rather delicate that, that, that day after late night, the night before. It was because of the way it was staged. And it was absolutely intended uh, to provoke an emotional reaction. The debate, however, has fallen in kind of two parallel lines between those who were very excited and very happy and proud of it, and I would have to say a lot of Egyptian uh, friends and colleagues have expressed particular uh, a pride at the show, um, very impressive, very spectacular um, show, and then those who believe perhaps it was being used by the current regime in Egypt uh, and was giving a, a very partial view and very selective and stylized view of history and how how museum and, and heritage uh, is presented. These two opinions, I think, uh, have, 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 have validity. It was an incredibly spectacular show. It was in many ways quite camp, uh, very glamorous, very glitzy, uh, very dramatic. But then a lot of state events anywhere in the world are. And make no mistake, if we had in the UK a bunch of royal mummies, or if in the United States of America they had a bunch of mummified presidents 
and they had to move them, they'd probably do exactly the same. And I think there is a danger in judging uh, the present Egyptian state in a way that we don't for Western countries. And that is rooted absolutely in colonialism and <laughs> um, uh, the sinister undertones of, of, of people in Egypt being fundamentally different. Uh, and I'm pretty sceptical about that. Uh, recently, uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, the Queen's husband, passed away. And there was a funeral for him with some pretty arcane and uh, rather camp rituals. We seem fine with that. Um, but in a way, that is just as contingent and is just as historical as what was going on, I think, in, in Cairo. So I thought it was a very, in some ways, moving performance. It raised issues, of course, about the value and uh, presentation of heritage and culture, but we should, yeah, judge these um, performances, because it was indeed a performance, on a global uh, stage. The mummies had to move uh, for uh, conservation reasons, if we're agreeing that we, we want to conserve them and not, not bury them uh, and forget about them, then they, they, they are better off moved. And so I don't know what the, the current setup arrangements are in the NEMEC, the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization. I would be happy to report back when, hopefully, at the end of this year, I can get back out to Egypt. But it's a great question, uh, Steve, uh, and one I hope to blog about in the very near uh, future. So uh, I have another uh, question, and I don't know who this came in from. Uh, I missed the name. Apologies. Uh, of 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 who, who it who it was, but someone has asked about how did the ancient Egyptians date time? How did they mark time in terms of year dates? Now this is something I've touched on before. Uh, so you don't go back to. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the questioner, but the point was made that if you went back to fourteen something BCE and asked Queen Hatshepsut, what year is it? She's not going to say 1473 BCE because she doesn't know uh, the common era is about to start. Uh, that dating system is, is going to be used. So uh, the questioner already probably knew this, but in ancient times, in Egyptian times, things were dated according to the ruler, uh, the national or the local ruler, uh, depending on the context, but usually the pharaoh. So when the new pharaoh comes to the throne, uh, you call that year one. New new year system uh, goes on. When you've got a long-lived pharaoh like Ramesses, you can go up to year 66. Whereas with Tutankhamun, you can only go to year nine because he only is on the throne for, uh, for nine years. So at the moment in the UK, Elizabeth II has been on the throne for, gosh, coming up to... Uh, oh, 69 years. Uh, so we would be in the 68th, I guess, regnal year of Elizabeth II. So if you asked Hatshepsut, what might she actually say? Well, the way the standard formula for dating is, you're in, um, so, so there's a system of months, three months and, and uh, days, days within the month, 30 uh, days to the month, uh, three seasons in the year, um, and the seasons are to do with um, sowing and planting and harvesting and uh, the, the agricultural year. So you, you name the, the, the season, uh, you name the, the, uh, the, the day, and you would say under the majesty or the person or the manifestation of Mat Ka Ra in that case, the, the name of Queen Hatshepsut. So I presume, if you asked her direct, having appeared in your time machine, she'd say, it is year 10, under my majesty, under my chem, under my presence, under my person, under my uh, manifestation. Although Hatshepsut is interesting because she co-rules with uh, her stepson, uh, Tutmo was the third, and so maybe she might say under our majesties uh, if she were uh, deferring to the stepson. So 
in answer to the question, there's not a, um, a linear sequential uh, series of, of, of dates as we think of today. There's the cyclical dating. So it's more what the ancient Egyptians would call nechech time than jet time. Jet is long, linear, eternity. Nechech time is the, the cyclical annual uh, agricultural style a year. So ask Hatshepsut, and she would say the year since she took the throne. Which is confusing if there are lots of kings coming along at uh, in quick succession when you don't get far into a, a dating uh, sequence and you have to specify which king or which ruler because you can also date things to local governors. Um, you get that, for example, in the Middle Kingdom. Um, so, yeah, that's the answer to your questions. Um, I've not seen any other questions appear. That's not to say that they haven't appeared. Um, but if you have any questions, comments, opinions, things that you want to discuss, uh, follow me at Egypt MCR. All of these videos will be uh, uploaded onto our website, uh, MM From Home. Uh, so even if you couldn't catch this live, hopefully uh, you'll be able to catch it again. Thank you for all your questions and I hope to see you all next Thursday at 2pm UK time uh, for more uh, Egyptology Live.